Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Not only do bees give us honey, but also pollinate crops. Today we're going to talk about some of the issues bees are facing. Also, we're going out in the garden to look at problems with tomatoes and how to fix them. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is David Glover. Mr. David is the Bartlett B. Whisperer. And Mr. D is with us today. Thanks for joining us. Howdy, howdy. Hey. All right, Mr. David. Let's talk about the bees, you know, specifically this whole colony collapse disorder. Well, one of the problems we have is when we give a disease or a symptom uh, a name, people look for the smoking gun. Yeah. Colony collapse disorder is actually a conglomeration of things going on with bees where they die. The hive has brewed honey pollen in it, but there are no bees. They just disappeared. And so several years ago, they came up with that name. There have been a lot of studies done to try to figure out what's going on, and we've got several different diseases that crop up, several different mites that pop in, and yet not all of them are at the same time that the bees disappear. Right. So can we talk about some of those diseases and some of those mites for the folks? Well, the big one that I want to talk about okay. is the varroa mite. And okay. varroa is like a bee tick. It mm -hmm. latches onto the bee and it starts sucking the lymphatic system and eating on it. That it's not all the damage it does. It gets into the hive and lays its eggs in on the larva as they're growing. Mm -hmm. They have four or five baby mites in the cell with the larva as it grows, and it sucks the life out of the larva, and oh. it just continues to propulate. That's bad. What we found over the last couple of years is that the varroa also vectors about 20 different diseases. Wow. So as we look at the colony collapse disorder, we start realizing some of the diseases are carried by varroa. Bees are social creatures. As they bump up against each other, as they share food, these mites jump from bee to bee. And so when we truck half of our colonies of bees to, say, California for the almond fields, if there's one colony there that has varroa, as they're pollinating the almonds, they can spread to all the other colonies. And then when they go back home, they carry them back home. So that's my gut feeling okay. says that wow. one mite could be the carrier of all the problems that we're having with colony collapse. There are other things that go along with it, but um, well, think about it this way. The mite is a parasite. Okay. Okay. Imagine being pregnant. I've never done that. My wife's done it twice. <laughs> but imagine being pregnant. There's a creature sucking the life out of you. While you're pregnant, you get the flu or you get gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is associated with the pregnancy. So you get a disease that's associated with the varroa mite. And you now have to go two miles to gather your groceries. The mm -hmm. bees are going out gathering their pollen, gathering nectar. And as they come back home, they may go through a field that's got pesticide on it. Mm -hmm. it may make them drunk, hard to get back home. The pregnant woman syndrome, she's pregnant, she's got uh, the flu, she's gathering groceries at Walmart, she's walking back home and she decides to stop at the local bar. Mm. and get a six-pack. Mm. Will she make it home? Will the bees make it home? And that's part of the problems that we have is it's a multiple and interacting causality for the colony collapse to happen. Wow. Crazy? It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, things that we look at when we go out online, and a lot of your viewers are, are online and they see things. Mm -hmm. that, 30, 40 percent colony loss in the world. And as we look at the numbers, eventually 30 percent by 30 percent by 30 percent, we're going to lose all our bees, right? Right. Mm -mm. Um, beekeepers realize that as we lose our bees over winter, we have to do something in the spring to build them back up. And so we'll take a colony that's strong, we'll split it in half, we'll have two colonies. We can buy bees, we have beekeepers that do nothing but raise 
colonies of bees for sale. Okay. We have beekeepers who are queen breeders and all they do is raise queens. Mm. So when we look at a 30% loss, this last year for the state of Tennessee, our winter loss was 20%. Mm. Our whole year loss was like um, 36, 47, 47.7% is what we lost. And when we look at that, if we get to a 50% margin of loss, when we split those bees, all we're doing is coming back to our status quo of last year. So we are losing our bees. Some states are losing as much as 62% of their bees Whoa. each year. It's a big percentage. It's not all of them. Some states are losing none, but those states that are losing none don't have bees to begin with. Okay. In the back of our minds, we also need to remember that the, the honeybee is not indigenous to the United States. Right. We brought it in. Right. And the major reason we have them isn't the honey. It's because the United States is a huge agricultural mm -hmm. community. We generate a lot of food and we need those bees to pollinate. We're talking about $15 billion of agriculture business that would be lost if we didn't have the honeybee. Mm -hmm. 20 different crops yeah. that are specifically pollinated by wow. honeybees. Wow, so we don't have those honeybees, you have higher food prices. Higher food prices. And we're yeah. actually getting higher food prices already because with the loss of bees, that loss is being transferred yeah. back to the growers mm -hmm. because of rental contracts for the bees. And so it's going back out. So it really is happening already. Wow. If people want to get more information about bees, I mean, who do you follow? Who do you go to for your information? Because there's a lot of stuff out there on the web and a lot of this stuff is not true. A lot of it's not true. There's a lot of, and, and I don't mean it in a bad way, yeah, yeah. too green and tree hugging. I've hugged trees, I love trees, I like to climb them. USDA, Department yes, yeah. of Agriculture is almost dead on with all of their statistics. They've now incorporated information from Bee Informed Partnership, which is an extension. Actually, one of the guys working with it is at UT hmm, Knoxville. Good. I met with him this last weekend. We discussed all of this. Next year's report is going to incorporate the Bee Informed Partnerships numbers wow. because they're able to tap into the beekeepers. Beekeepers are kind of secretive about where their bees are because we don't want them stolen now. These Stealing bees, uh, rustling bees, is becoming a big business also. Wow, how about that? It's kind of crazy, but yeah. with the Bee Informed Partnership and with the USDA, we've got real numbers. Uh, just because you see that we've lost 40% of our bees doesn't mean it's true in Tennessee or in Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi loss was 36.7 okay. for the whole total year, but winter loss was 20%. Our normal winter loss is around 30%. With the advent of colony collapse disorder, we've been at the 30% margin. Before colony collapse, national average for 14%. Wow. Mr. Day, we definitely appreciate that insightful information. That's pretty good. I see Mr. D's nodding his head over yeah, there. That's, that's really one of the best descriptions I've heard. I'm, Real good. I'm impressed. Yeah. I appreciate y'all. Hey, we thank you much for being here. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, let's take a look at our tomato plants and see if we have any problems here. Yeah, we got a few problems, but I tell you, we've got a heavy <laughs> crop of tomatoes, so I want to, you know, we've done a real good job growing growing these uh, these uh, tommy, tommy, tommy toes or whatever, <laughs> uh, cherry tomatoes, they have a lot of different names, there's a lot of different varieties of them, but we've got a heavy crop on here. Uh, we see a, two or three problems. This is a classic example of a, an excellent plant to grow in a raised bed or mm -hmm. in a flower garden. I mean, they're ornamental, they're pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, talk about edible landscaping. This is yeah, something this that is you it. could, you know, readily do. Um, what, but the apparent damage, I, there are two things that jump out at me when okay. I walk up here. The first thing is we have a little bit of blight, right. a little, a little, I guess it's yeah. an early blight that's moving up into the plant. And you can't cure that 
You can't make these brown leaves green, but you could start spraying this plant with uh, either chlorine, uh, chlorothalonil mm -hmm. bravo or maneb or mancozeb, something like right. that, and start spraying it about every seven to 10 days and uh, keep that protective coat of fungicide and you would stop it from spreading up to the other leaves. Uh, so that's something that you could do. If you did that, uh, you would continue to be able to pick these nice fruit until frost. Okay. Until Let me ask you about this though. Would you pinch these off then? You know, the ones that have the blight, could you, could you do that? Uh, you could, homeowner? you could. And if you did, don't just throw them down. Right. You know, take them out of the garden, take them away and put them in the bag, double bag them and get rid of them. <laughs> don't put them in your mulch pile right. because uh, it can continue to spread. Uh, and picking them off is not going to stop it from spreading sure. because even though you don't see the damage on these green leaves, the spores are already there and the, d the disease is already spreading up into some of these other leaves. But you can stop it and prevent it from, you know, getting worse okay. if you uh, if you will start using fungicide on a regular basis. Okay. Another thing I see, and I think this problem has already been solved, but there is some <laughs> very clear uh, very clear evidence that we've had tomato hornworms uh -huh. or tobacco hornworms out here. Uh, they uh, will eat the entire leaf off, uh, and and uh, I understand that they uh, about a week or so ago they picked six mm -hmm. hornworms off the plant. Now I don't see any fresh damage. I don't see any fresh um, uh, che <laughs> leaf chewing or fresh worm poo poo yeah. out here. <laughs> uh, so I assume they got them all. Uh, if you do see more uh, earworm, uh, hornworm damage, then uh, you can pick them off. You know that's been been successful in doing that, or you could spray with BT, right. uh, Dipel, the Javelin. Mm -hmm. The Bacillus thuringiensis product does a good job uh, controlling the tomato hornworms when they're small, especially when they're small. Right. And it'll even it'll get the big boys. Get the big ones. Yeah, it will. Because yeah. we were talking earlier, I've, I've never seen one of the little ones. I always see the big boys. The little ones yeah. are, or the, all of the hornworms are masters of, of camouflage. Yes, they I are. think the U.S. Army has learned something from tomato <laughs> hornworms. They're masters of camouflage. And, and the smallest one I've seen is about an inch long. Yeah. And I know they've got to be smaller than an inch long, yeah. you know, to get to be an inch That's long. Right. But you yeah. never, right. they, they, they blend in and they hide and, and uh, they're, uh, they're uh, really, really hard to find on, on, on tomato plants. Yeah. And whoever, you know, picked these, I, my, my hat's off to them. <laughs> you know, they did a good job. Uh, another thing I see here, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, this tomato plant, there was a program and you put in an irrigation system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this plant has been getting plenty of water, plenty of water. Adequate, adequate water. And I understand about uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a light application of uh, a nitrogen was applied to the plant. And we see some splitting fruit here. Classic, classic examples of, of uh, tomato fruit that have uh, gotten uh, that, that have been dry, and, and mostly it's the water mm -hmm. issue. But the combination of water and fertilizer will cause it to split like this, splitting fruit. And you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong yeah, with that. Yeah, I say, it doesn't mean that the fruit is bad, right? It's not bad at all. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm gonna eat this one. <laughs> uh, but uh, that split, you know, it's sealed. That suture is kind of sealed. Uh, the plant, you know, does a good job of, of trying to heal. Sure. But, uh, there he goes. What does it taste like? Absolutely nothing <laughs> wrong with that tomato. That is a really, really good tasting tomato. But uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, you'll see the smaller ones are not splitting. You know they have you know, adequate water and adequate fertilizer. However, I'm fixing them. I'm about to give them another shot of nitrogen. Okay, and uh, and that's a, that's a good thing that you can do if you want to encourage your tomato plants to continue to produce until frost. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a good idea. About every 30 days, about once a month, uh, you can give them about a tablespoon per plant of 34-00. Okay. That's strictly nitrogen. Yeah. So nitrogen will last about four to six weeks. Uh, during rainy conditions, it'll last uh, 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 only four weeks. It readily leaches from mm -hmm. the soil. 
uh, uh, during dry conditions it'll last six weeks usually uh, but if you have adequate irrigation like we have here it will uh, only last about uh, four weeks and it's been about four weeks since these tomatoes had a shot of nitrogen so I'm about to give them another shot. Give them a shot. Uh, yeah. Again one tablespoon of nitrogen okay. per plant no more than that because this 3400 30, uh, um, uh, is, is one third nitrogen so uh, 34 percent a little over one third yeah. so I have got me some 3400 here and I don't have a tablespoon <laughs> but I've got, I know about how big a tablespoon is. This is off of a milk jug, and that's pretty doggone close. All right. And, uh, you know, in government work, uh, <laughs> plus or minus 10%, and I'm going to kind of shake that and make it level off. That looks like about a tablespoon <laughs> to me. So I'm just going to kind of sprinkle this around the plant. I don't have to get it right under it. I'm going to try to put about a half of it out. All right. And then go back and put the other half out. Because like you mentioned about the corn, right, the root systems are going to be out there a little bit, right? Right. 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 Even, even on a tree, the root system is out one and a half times the height of that tree right. on, on the average. So that's probably a pretty good rule of thumb for, for plants. And this tomato plant is four, four and a half feet tall, so probably so six feet out. out, six feet out. All right, Mr. D, we appreciate that demonstration, and I'm sure the plant will appreciate it as well. Very good. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. All right, this is our Q&A session. Mr. David, you jump in there with us, okay? Okay. All right, here's our first viewer email. Do my thornless blackberry plants have a virus? They discolor around the base, then the plant dies. I have lost 85 to 90% of the plants in this bed so far. The healthy shoots dug up and replant also die, but plants 50 feet away thrive. What is happening? How do I treat my plants? What precautions should I take to prevent it from spreading? Any help would be appreciated, and this is from Mr. James. Mr. D, I see you thinking about this one pretty good there. Yeah, you know, I was kind of, I'm very perplexed. Um, first, I wonder what variety, hmm. but, but I, uh, we do know it's thornless, and I yeah, assume we know it's, it's thornless. erect, or I don't know whether it's trailing type or not. But uh, the fact that the, fact that the, the plant dies yeah. and, and, and the newly propagated plants die. die and adjacently there are healthy plants now I'm assuming that the soil type is the same and that it's just as well drained in both locations right. and if that's the case I'm thinking that we may have a, a fungal wilt verticillium wilt and and that can be deadly and I, if that's the case you do not want to try to propagate a plant from a plant that's affected right. with verticillium it's just like uh, with you know Tomatoes. The if you have verticillium wilt on tomatoes, you don't even want to handle a sick plant and then go handle another one because you can spread the disease. Right. So my recommendation is to dig that plant up and get rid of it. You know, pull it up by the roots, get as many of the roots as you can because verticillium, the wilt fungi live in the soil. Yeah, it's in the soil. Yeah. Right. Do soil not plant. Board. Do not plant another plant in that spot. Uh, just just try to get as far away from that spot as you can and then destroy, burn, if if you will, burn that plant. And 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 uh, that, but that's what it sounds like to me. I don't know. What do you think? I, you know, I, I pretty much think the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. the ones 50 feet away are doing just fine. Right. So yeah. I'm thinking it has to be something in that soil. And blackberries are tough. Uh, They're tough. tough. It takes yeah, a lot to kill a yeah, blackberry. You, I mean, you can't even easily go. kill it with herbicides. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> they, 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 and, right. and but for one to do that, and and what you described as classic symptoms of a verticillium wilt in blackberries. Yeah. I mean, that I, could I, have come in with a, that could have come in with the plant uh, uh, could have. from the could nursery. Have. Could have. Uh, could have. You know, there's that. several ways it could have gotten there, but uh, the organism does thrive in wet soils, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, but that's that's what I'll bet it is. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would get it out of there, get rid of it because it's this plant, you know, mm -hmm. these in this area, and then the ones that we're doing just fine. So I'm definitely thinking of something in the soil, and that's the first thing that came to my mind. So mm -hmm. yeah. 
All right, Mr. James, I hope that helps you out. Uh, here's our next uh, viewer email. How do you grow ginger root? Is it even possible to grow it here in a Memphis garden? Ginger likes zones 9 through 12. Tropical. Uh, we're a 7B here, not, not a 9 tropical. through 12, not tropical. Uh, so your ginger will struggle here through our winters. Um, if you want to try it, I Mr. Have. David, which you have. I have, and I've grown it. Your success? Not. You grew it as not. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was tasty. It worked, but uh, you do not want it outside during yeah. the winter. Yeah, outside in the garden is what uh, Mr. Janice you know, wants to do. I, I wouldn't plant it outside in the garden. Mm -hmm. I would try it in a greenhouse or plant it in a container, bring it in the house. Uh, do it that way. And keep it away from two-year-old sons. <laughs> and keep it away from two-year-old sons. Right? <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, it, uh, it's a tropical plant. Uh, it, it does like filtered sun. Mm -hmm. It likes good, rich soil. Um, it works. But me. not here. All right, Mr. Janice, hope that uh, helps you out. Here's our next question. Every year my peaches are covered with little black spots. What should I have done to prevent this, Mr. D. Little black spots on yeah. peaches. Cover spray. You know, little black spots. You know, the biggest problem with peaches, nectarines, and plums is a disease called brown rot. And brown rot's not little black spots. Brown rot is large mm -hmm. brown rots on the fruit. Little black spots could be a bacterial spot. Or I thought scab. Scab. Peach scab. Could be scab. Well, peach scab. And mm -hmm. if that's the case, the regular spray schedule will take care of it. I bet yeah. it's peach scab. Regular spray schedule. And according to the UT Home Orchard Guide, <laughs> uh, they recommend uh, keptan or sulfur or chlorothalonil uh, as, uh, again, starting, starting uh, at bloom with only the fungicide, the keptan or the chlorothalonil. And at petal fall, when most of the petals are, and that should protect your honeybees. Yes. And, and when most of the petals are falling off, again, only the fungicide, because the fungicide's not gonna hurt your, your honeybees. Uh, that would be captan or sulfur or chlorothalonil. Uh, later on, after all the blooms are off, then if you have a, well, with peaches, plums, or nectarines, you are going you to are. have plum curculio. Yeah. And at that time, you need to add uh, uh, malathion uh, with a mixture or immunox or something like that to control those uh, the plum curculio. But do not add it, it never ever use an insecticide uh, on a blooming plant mm -hmm. because uh, that uh, that will kill honeybees. Mm -hmm. I mean it's not maybe it will kill honeybees. EPA has done a really good job of putting the warning on the ones for anything that's bee specific to spray not during bloom. Right. And I've seen that on the label. Mm -hmm. Exactly yeah. right. Right. And the label is a legal document that yes, we're bound by law to follow. That's right. Yes, it is. All right. Appreciate that, Mr. D. Here's our next viewer email. How can you tell when your spaghetti squash is ready to be picked? Once it's ready, how long would it be in its prime? If I don't get it at the right time, will it become tough or rot? And this is Miss Nancy in Powell, Tennessee. Beats me. All right, here we go. All right, have a little experience with this one with the spaghetti squash. You can, look, it has to be a uniform dark yellow or dark golden color. If you have any green tint, let it stay on the vine because it's not ready, okay? Deep yellow golden color. Or the second thing that grandma used to do was this, the old scratch test. You scratch it, if it's soft or if it leaves a mark, leaves a scratch, Leave it on the vine, it's not ready yet, because you want it to be tough. Tough. You want it to be tough. So if you do that scratch test again and it's tough, you don't see a scratch mark, it's hard, it's ready to be picked. And if you pick it, if you actually store it in a cool, dry place, don't let them touch, okay? Yeah. They'll actually keep for a couple of weeks. And what she would always uh, do is she would mix up like a 10% bleach solution, 90% water, just kind of rub, you know, those rinds a little bit. No mildew, yep. no mold, no rot. And it'll keep for about a couple of weeks. How long will it keep on that plant? I mean, how, how long a window do you have when it's right? The window's not gonna be too big. <laughs> uh -huh. So once it gets right, you need to go ahead and get it off there. Right. And, and if you do, uh, you know, if you mess around and, and, 
and you're picking it off and you separate it from that stem and just kind of leave it on the ground or something like that, mm -hmm. it will start to rot pretty oh, yeah. quick. Yeah. yeah, if you bruise that stem or anything like that or, you know, make it or cut it or something, that thing will rot pretty huh? quick, real sensitive. So, yeah, a real small window. But that's what Grandma did. It seemed to work pretty good. Don't argue with Grandma. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mr. David, Mr. D, we're out of time. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.